Hi, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Amelia Holmes, and I am excited to introduce you to Anne Martindale, who is one of our interpreters here at the Nantucket Historical Association, and is incredibly knowledgeable about many of our sites. And tonight she's gonna to talk to us about the old jail. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Anne. Okay, well, welcome there. My name is Anne Martindale. And uh, for the past several years, I've been an interpreter at the old jail on Nantucket. Now the history of our jail is much more than a story about a slightly spooky structure built in 1805. Uh, we certainly needed a jail way before then. And uh, you may be surprised to know that our jail is actually the fourth jail on the island. So how did this jail come to be? Who was put in the jail and why? Who were the sheriffs and jail keepers responsible for the jail? And why was it finally closed? As you'll hear, the history of our jail is really a story of old Nantucket. Jail looks exactly as it did when it was built in uh, 1805 in response to an event that really shocked the town. In 1795, we opened our first bank, the Nantucket Bank. It was the third bank in the state, and everyone was really quite proud of it. But sadly, it was robbed almost immediately. The robbers were finally caught, put in the old jail on High Street, and they escaped without any trouble at all. The stolen money, almost $21,000, was never recovered, and the townspeople were outraged and absolutely determined to have a jail that would be escape proof. So this jail right here, this is the result. Next slide. So our first jail, if you can even call it that, wasn't a jail at all. It was located by William Bunker's house on Westchester Street, right near No Bottom Pond. And you can see that in the highlighted section of this map of the old settlement. As it had happened, the jail was right in the building where Mr. Bunker kept his pigs. And uh, so it was in 1676 that Mr. Bunker was hired to keep this jail and his salary was four pounds a year, all paid in grain. Now the first prisoner we know about was Peter Folger, who happened to be the town clerk. And he was jailed in Mr. Bunker's pig house for seven months. This was 1678. And you can imagine, I don't actually have a picture of Mr. Folger, but I do have this wonderful picture of an old pig house. So there it is. And he was put in jail because it was the height of a feud between the early settlers. There were the original proprietors who controlled all the land and the votes and so forth. And then they recruited the second group of settlers to the island, the so-called half share owners, gave them a half share in the island. And uh, at the peak of this feud, Mr. Folger, who was a half share holder, hid the town book, volume one of the town records. And this has never been found to this day. And eventually, Mr. Folger was pardoned by the governor of New York, because as you might know, Nantucket was actually a part of New York colony until 1692. Now, we have no image of Mr. Bunker either, our first jailer, but I have to laugh because they both ended up in the same place. Mr. Bunker, you can see his name. They're both buried at the um, old cemetery in Kapalm, near Kapalm Harbor. And Mr. Bunker's name is at the very bottom of this cemetery marker. And Mr. Folger's name is, I think, fourth from the top. Now the second jail was right nearby. This is an old postcard of No Bottom Pond. And the second jail was put up by the town in 1696. We're still on Westchester Road and we're still right near the pond. And by then, Nantucket was part of Massachusetts Bay Colony, where the judges and the magistrates and the sheriffs, the whole governing apparatus was appointed by the general court. The general court was sort of a combination court system and legislature. And then a few years later, the town built uh, its first town hall right nearby. They called it the townhouse, and it was also constructed on Westchester Street. 
So finally, we have a courtroom where uh, criminals can be tried because before then, court was held in the homes of local magistrates. And if there were a, a big uh, crime, some sort of major crime, that all had to happen on the mainland in Barnstable. So one other thing, sort of interesting and sort of terrible actually, the early punishments were quite primitive. Uh, you could be whipped at a whipping post set up, um, they were, the whipping post was on Upper Main Street, sort of where the Civil War monument is today. And if you were accused of stealing, you could be branded on your forehead with a B, B for burglary, with a hot iron. So those horrible punishments were not uncommon until the Quakers put an end to them, an end to this cruelty in the early 1700s. Now, many of the early court cases involved the Wampanoag population. About 1,500 Wampanoag were on the island when the first settlers came. And only 16, 60 years later, this population had dropped all the way down to about 700 because they simply uh, were not immune to the diseases brought by the white settlers. And so uh, when Dorcas Honorable, uh, shown here in this wonderful old photograph, when she died in 1855, she was said to be the last uh, Wampanoag who was born on Nantucket. Although there were other descendants of Wampanoag, but she was, she was said to be the last. And the settlers insisted on applying English common law to the Wampanoag, who had a completely different concept about property rights. In 1672, the first recorded case involving, involving a Wampanoag was when uh, Jephthah the Indian was um, sued for non-payment of a debt. And they were frequently brought into court for stealing food, rustling sheep, and so forth. Many were fined and had to work off their fines on a whaling ship. And also, sadly, uh, 11 Wampanoag were actually hung for murder um, at the old town gate, the, uh, called the New Town Gate. And that was actually located where the uh, rotary is today at the end of Orange Street. So the last of these hangings occurred in 1769. And the hangman, in every case, was also a Wampanoag. Now our third jail is shown, uh, was on High Street, the corner of High Street and Pleasant Street called the High Street Jail. And that's where that little blue dot is on this map. And uh, all of a sudden we're downtown and that's because when the Kapam Harbor at the old settlement closed up, the townspeople actually moved their ho houses. They disassembled them, put them back together in the new downtown area by the Great Harbor. And so um, they even moved the, the townhouse, which had been out on Westchester Road. Then they moved it to the corner of Main Street and Milk Street, shown here on this little red dot. And by that time, um, of course, the courthouse was still in the, the townhouse and uh, crimes were tried in that, uh, in that courthouse at the corner of Main and Milk. Now, as I mentioned, the High Street Jail turned out to be a big disappointment. On the weekend of June 20th, 1795, everyone was at a, the big sheep shearing festival, which is what you see here. And when the cashier of Nantucket Bank came to work on Monday morning, he found that uh, $20,927 was missing. This was all in coin, all deposited by the local whaling merchants. And the poor cashier, since he had the only key, he was placed under arrest. And this was just the beginning of a huge controversy that went on and on with various investors in the bank, various directors of the bank, all accusing each other of plotting to steal the, steal the money from the bank. And uh, about a year later, oh, by the way, the real robbers, they got off the island and went on this big spending spree all through New York and New England and finally were arrested, brought back to Nantucket, put in the high street jail, but then they escaped as I said, without much trouble at all. Uh, one of them was an expert locksmith and he took some pewter spoons and fashioned them into keys and got them out with, with no trouble at all. The unfortunate cashier of the bank, he'd been in jail for all this time and he was eventually found not guilty and pardoned, excuse me, he was found guilty 
originally, but then he was pardoned after spending two years in jail. So that was a bit of a sad story about our bank, or our first bank. So the town residents, as I said, they were insisted on having a new jail that would be escape proof. And this was the result. They hired two brothers. Their names were John and Perez Jenkins to construct a new jail on Vestal Street. The cost was just a little more than $2,000. It would have four cells, uh, two downstairs, two upstairs. And um, each cell would have a, um, a kind of a very primitive toilet. There were two bunk beds and a stove and a fireplace for, wall, for warmth. And then you can see here in this picture, there was just iron everywhere. It was all around the walls, in the ceilings, under the floors. And there was no getting out of this um, prison, that, uh, certainly not through the walls. Now, um, let's see. So when the jail was finished, the town conveyed it over to the county because the sheriff worked for the county and it was thought appropriate for the for the uh, jail to also be under the control of the county. So when our jail was completed, it was the responsibility of the county sheriff. In this case, it was John Gardner. Now John Gardner, he was 81 years old then, and he was in fact the great grandson of another John Gardner, one of the original half shareholders. And the next year, Mr. Gardner, who was by then 82, was replaced by the next sheriff. His name was Jeremiah Lawrence. And he remained sheriff for 16 years until he quit to run a dry goods store on Main Street. So you may be hearing, uh, you may be hearing the beginning of a trend here. Our sheriffs were often elderly, many times retired mariners, as you'll hear, and quite often uh, needed to have another job in order to make ends meet. By 1822, there was a new sheriff. His name was Uriah Gardner, and he would be sheriff off and on for uh, 40 years until he, uh, until he died at age 78, when he was still sheriff, of course. And judging from the newspapers, uh, Uriah spent most of his time holding sheriff sales. These were sales um, when a debtor couldn't pay his debts, the sheriff would seize his property auction it off at a sale, usually held right in the street. And he also, this is Sheriff Gardner, he also made the papers again when he told the court of Sessions, uh, you know, we really need to have a jailkeeper's cottage to be in front of the jail so this jailkeeper can keep an eye on things. And uh, they accomplished this apparently by moving the keeper's cottage from the High Street Jail over to the Vestal Street Jail. And it's uh, still there today. This is a wonderful old photo of the Nantucket waterfront, which was a pretty rough place back in the day. And the first inmates of our jail really reflected that situation. There were all sorts of knife fights, assaults, theft, uh, especially of rum. That was a popular, <laughs> that was of great interest. And uh, so our first known prisoner was uh, Paul Warren. He was jailed in 1806 for failing to pay damages of $26 after he broke someone's finger in a fight. And then the first murderer put in jail, his name was Jabez Cushman, accused of killing a man in a bar fight in 1820. But we know he was released soon after that because he got married shortly after, afterwards. And even in 1835, must have reformed his character entirely because they elected him as constable. Now, surprising, escapes from this so-called escape-proof jail were not that unusual. One of the first um, escapes happened after two men uh, were arrested. They, they had gone to an auction, stolen someone's pocketbook at this auction, which is shown right here in this old stereoscope slide, gone to their boarding house to count out the money, uh, and they were caught, put in jail, but they, they managed to escape I went to England and no one ever saw them or the money after that. The another early escape was when uh, actually the earliest one was in 1811 when a young man, uh, William Morris, accused of stealing $100, he twisted free from the sheriff 
as he was being led to its cell. So you could kind of get it, you could kind of escape as you were coming and going, but not at once you were actually locked in. Oh, with this exception. So in 1900, there was a 15 year old boy who escaped by climbing up the chimney of the upstairs east cell. He knocked out some bricks, climbed onto the roof, and, um, but he was recaptured. And then of course they, the old chimney flue was replaced by a much smaller one. Now, who were the jail keepers? Well, for a while, we don't even know any of their names. Uh, these men were appointed by the sheriff, paid a small salary from the county, and given housing in that little jail keeper's cottage right in front of the jail. Now, the first jail keeper we know about was Isaac Myrick. He was a rope keeper, excuse me, a rope maker, which is why I'm showing you this slide. You can see in the bottom middle of the slide, three long buildings. Those were old rope walks. And Isaac's owned one of these rope walks with his father. This was their primary business. And uh, the jail conveniently was right nearby. So he could rope, you know, tend to the rope walk and then go look in on the jail from time to time. And we only know that he was a, the jail keeper because the newspaper announced his retirement in 1858. Now, as for the sheriffs, as I mentioned, they were often retired mariners. And uh, this is the first image we have of a, of a sheriff, Peleg Slocum Folger. And as it happened, he was descended from Peter Folger, that very uh, <laughs> a town clerk who was, who was locked up in the pig house jail so many years ago. And not, after, not long after Peleg became sheriff, now we're, we're in 1831, he received a a uh, visit from the Board of Managers of the Prison Discipline Society, and they filed a report that said the smell of the jail was so horrible, you could smell it before you even got inside. But on the plus side, the report said the four prisoners that were there told the board that the, uh, the food was quite good and the bedding was clean. So the plus side. Now, um, when uh, Sheriff Folger died, he was replaced by Elijah Starbuck. And uh, Mr. Starbuck made his, made his living in a variety of ways. He held auctions, he operated a boarding house, but his big case occurred in connection with the Manufacturers and Mechanics Bank. And that's what we see here, the door of the vault to that bank. And so the big case happened when the, uh, the cashier of that bank, his name was Barker Burnell, was arrested for embezzling $130,000 from the bank. He was uh, put, in the, put in the jail and uh, eventually found not guilty, but decided to move to, to Chile after the stress of the trial. And as for the bank, as I, you may have noticed the trial, Mr. Uh, Burnell's trial was in June of 1846, and the bank was sort of finished off in July of 1846 because that was when the great fire occurred. The bank burned to the ground and this vault is all we have left of the bank and it is in our NHA collection. So you should check that out. Now in 1854, um, a house of correction was put up right by the jail. So you can see the jail on the left House of Correction on the right. And this House of Correction actually used to be the town workhouse out at Quays. Uh, Quays was about five miles out of town and they had a workhouse for people who, who were poor and needed to work to pay off their debts. They had an asylum out there for people who were elderly or not able to take care of themselves. But that was a social experiment that didn't work so well and they decided to move the House of Correction right back in town next to the jail. And by the way, they moved the asylum. Uh, they reassembled that on Orange Street and it eventually became uh, the island home. So in the House of Correction, we had 11 cells and that became used for people who were considered less of a risk, women, juveniles, people who couldn't pay their, their debts and um, Let's see. And it also functioned as a debtor's prison so that uh, you, you could 
you could try and work there and pay off whatever debts you owed. And it remained there, the House of Correction remained there until 1955, when it was determined to be unsafe and was taken down. Now, this is a, a nice old painting of a, of a town meeting. And in 1855, the office of sheriff became a position that was elected at the town meeting rather than one that was appointed by the governor. And we still have Uriah Gardner, Sheriff Uriah Gardner on the scene. And he became, he became our first elected town sheriff, a position he held until he died at age 78. And he appointed a retired mariner, Benjamin Ray, Captain Benjamin Ray, as the keeper of the jail. And their, uh, their big case was the famous murder trial of Patience Gardner, which in hindsight really marked a, another low point in the local justice system. Uh, did I say, I hope I said the, her name correctly. Her name was Patience Cooper. And she was a 50 year old African American woman who was accused of killing an elderly shopkeeper, Phoebe Fuller, with a FID. And that's what we see here. A FID is an ivory tool used by mariners to untangle uh, ropes. And this FID, uh, Mrs., uh, the shopkeeper, Mrs. Fuller, was found uh, in, found, you know, collapsed and bleeding with this FID by her side. And uh, Mrs. Cooper was arrested. And it became the most famous trial of its day with all sorts of conflicting witnesses, three different versions of the story told by Mrs. Fuller, who died several weeks later. Now, Patience Cooper denied her guilt, but she was convicted anyway and uh, sentenced to serve 10 years for manslaughter. And she served that in the House of Corrections. And then after her release, she died, um, she went to the town asylum where she died at age 75. So not a, not a good story. Now we finally have a real picture, a real photograph of someone. This is uh, Captain Joseph McCleave and he was sheriff. Uh, he was our first sheriff with really a lot of time on his hands uh, from six, excuse me, from 1870 to 1876, there were absolutely no prisoners in the in the jail at all but mr mccleave kept himself very busy he had an import business down on the waterfront he imported coal and lime and apparently was very successful and he retired after serving 11 years and let his younger brother also a mariner uh, replace him as sheriff and uh captain mccleave named uh roland folger as the jail keeper and and Roland Folger, like many jail keepers, he had another job too. And uh, he had a basket shop. Mr. Folger had a basket shop on Main Street. And we actually have a few of his baskets in our collection. And when uh, Roland Folger resigned as a jail keeper at age 77, his son Daniel um, took over as keeper. And that was just in time to receive yet another visit from the prison committee of the Massachusetts legislature. And by then the jail was about 80 years old and the committee took a look and they said, this should be closed. Needless to say, <laughs> that didn't happen. There was a petition signed by 71 residents of Nantucket. They opposed the closing and the jail remained open another 50 years. Now here's that keeper's cottage. Just when Daniel Folger was getting comfortable in the keeper's cottage, he was caught up in a little scandal. He had been inviting the inmates of the jail over to his house to eat dinner with him. And that all went really, really well <laughs> until one of them became intoxicated. And uh, one of his neighbors wrote an anonymous letter to the newspaper saying what an outrage this was. And Daniel, he was equally furious. He wrote a letter back saying, well, the sheriff had given me permission to do this. And it certainly didn't get his alcohol on my premises. And furthermore, I resign. So that was the end of uh, Daniel Folger. He was replaced by another um, sheriff, Stephen Gibbs, who last, didn't last too long. He was, Stephen was 70 and he decided he really didn't want to move 
you know, change his whole life and move into the keeper's cottage. So um, that was, uh, Mr. Gibbs also resigned fairly quickly, but perhaps he was a little discouraged by the, by the crime wave that sort of bubbled up again in the 1880s. So this is William Henry Chadwick. He was convicted in 1885 for embezzling $11,500 from the Pacific National Bank to complete construction of a so-called gentleman's club that he was building out near Squam. The project later became known as Chadwick's Follies. Chadwick's Folly. He was tried in Boston, but he requested that he serve his jail sentence in Nantucket so his family could bring him food and books and basket weaving equipment and so forth. And this is Chadwick's Folly. Um, really quite an amazing thing with a clubhouse and a stable and so forth. And this was all constructed, this was all there while Mr. Chadwick was busy serving out his jail term and he did get a, did run into a little luck. He had served three years and then he was pardoned by uh, President Grover Cleveland. And um, the, the uh, Chadwick's Folly, it was auctioned off, um, let's see, when was that year? Well, it was auctioned off uh, six years six years later, and um, finally torn down in 1956. Now, the other bit of the crime wave of, of the 1880s, there was a record for 14 prisoners housed in the jail in 1888, and that included four members of the Ramsdell housebreaking gang led by James Ramsdell. And I'm showing you this. Um, I'm showing you this this survey because you can see how close the jail and the House of Correction were together. They were just about three feet apart. And Mr. Ramsdell was in the jail. Mrs. Ramsdell was in the House of Correction, and she had rigged up a a kind of a pulley system with fishing line and a pulley so they could communicate with each other. And Mrs. Ramsdell was able to get her hands on a duplicate key and she kind of communicated this key right over to Mr. Chadwick as he was, uh, as he was, excuse me, Mr. Ramsdell as he was in jail. And he busted out of jail, uh, made his way to Madiket, stole a dory, rode out to Nantucket Sound, and uh, then got picked up by a, a schooner and made his way to New York where he was recaptured. Now, I, this may be my favorite picture. This is, uh, this is our next keeper of the jail, Frederick Parker. He started serving as, jail, as, as the jailer in 1890, and he served for the next 24 years. And here he is, where we have yet another visit of the prison committee. And this time, they said the jail should be closed. And the exact words of the report were that the jail was, quote, unfit and unsuited in every way for the confinement of human beings. Huh. But by this time, the jail was really used for prisoners at all. And like many other historic buildings in Nantucket, it had actually become a tourist attraction. Now here, you can see um, there's a little gate leading to the, the jail yard and the sign over it says, Old Jail. Now the jailer, the jailkeeper obviously didn't need any help finding the jail. This was for visitors, and they would walk through uh, that gate to visit the jail. There were curious newspaper reporters who came by too. So in 1911, we have a newspaper reporter from New Jersey who went to visit the jail. The jailer wasn't there. He found the jailkeeper's wife putting up her, her uh, washing, hanging her washing in the backyard. And uh, she said, well, my husband can't be hanging around all day. Another newspaper reporter in 1914 stopped by for a look and he was offered a key to the jail so he could just, you know, show himself through and have a look around then. And yet another reporter called it the Parker House as though it were a luxury hotel. Now, one of Mr. Parker's daughters, Susan, fell in love with uh, this gentleman, Arthur Eldridge. And he lived nearby at, on 11 Vestal Street and they got married. 
And when Mr. Parker retired at age 77, Mr. Eldridge, whom you see right here, his son-in-law, uh, became assistant keeper. So why all of a sudden do we need an assistant keeper? Well, that's because uh, it's in the <laughs> infinite wisdom of the, I guess it was the county commission, they decided that the county sheriff should get two salaries, $200 a year for being sheriff, another $55 for being keeper of the jail, but yet you still needed someone to actually be at the jail and watch over things. And so they called him the assistant keeper and paid him $50 a year. And we know from the newspaper that that meant he received $4.17 a month, which is in fact the very same salary that the county had set back in 1877. So not a huge future there. Now, Mr. Eldridge, he figured this out and left to become a teamster or wagon driver for American Express. And that brings us to our very last jailkeeper, Edgar Ellis, who uh, held a variety of jobs, a day laborer, plumber, carpenter. And he also, and I love this photo, he was also employed by the old Nantucket Railroad. And when he was named assistant keeper, in 1919, he continued all of his other occupations to make ends meet. So Mr. Ellis was on duty in October 1933 when the jail's last prisoner, Charles Freeman, was arrested. Mr. Freeman was put in the uh, west cell on the second floor and he called to Mr. Ellis for some water. And when Mr. Ellis showed up with the water, he hit him with a piece of uh, masonry that had broken off from the fireplace. He fled down the stairs. And the story is that his friends uh, put, him, uh, put him in a laundry basket and smuggled him off the island then. And, but after his escape, the town has, uh, installed this pass-through window that you see here. And the irony is, uh, well, the pass-through window, obviously, so water and food could be passed through the door without Opening up, a, opening up the door and having a prisoner escape. But the irony is uh, there were no more prisoners after this. So the, the window looks good, but was never actually used. And as for Mr. Freeman, he made his way to California where he was arrested again, this time put in Folsom prison. And in 1937, he unwisely wrote a letter to the Nantucket tax collector acquiring about some property in Sconset and he was easily traced and brought back to Massachusetts. Tried again, this time in New Bedford, and uh, he was charged for the original crime, plus break five years, he was sentenced to, uh, I think about 20 years for the original crime, then five years for breaking out of jail, and another five years for assaulting the jailkeeper, and spent uh, that time in Charleston prison. Now, in uh, the jail then after that, uh, was not used for 13 years. And in 1946, the county deeded the jail and the House of Correction to the NHA and uh, sold the keeper's house at an auction. The next summer, that would be 1947, the jail was open to the public. And that year there was another nice surprise. We got a letter from a donor who said she actually had the original iron lock to the jail, which weighed about 20 pounds and was 16 and a half inches long and the original key too and she gave those all to us and they are now the original lock is installed back at the jail so i encourage you all to come by for another look and you'll find that not really much has changed at all since 1805. so i'm happy to answer some questions now but uh i thought i would start off with with everyone's favorite question, which is why is our jail spelled G-A-O-L with a G? Well, this is the old English spelling and both spellings were used in Nantucket newspapers in the early 1800s. But the American spelling with the J uh, was used on this. So you can see we actually use that on, our, on the sign of the jail. You can see that right there. And um, the town also used jail with a J in its own uh, town documents and, and minutes. Oh, I don't know if you can see this chart or not, but I'm sort of a chart lover. And I 
came up with this just to track how often the two spellings are used in the local newspapers. You can see that it was um, jail with a G was, <laughs> jail with a G was used pretty often until the 1860s and then barely used at all. But then in 18, uh, in the 18, four, excuse me, in the 1940s, a uh, big comeback of jail. And that's because uh, the NHA started, we started calling it the jail, spelled it with a G, brought back the old English spelling a um, little bit. So that's it. That's, that's all I have. And hope you have some good questions for me. And thank you so much for doing this tonight. I um, I love this because I feel like the the number of stories that you share are just like not ones that are like really well known. I feel like, but are certainly really entertaining. At least as we're not participants in in those stories. Um, so I I really appreciate you sharing those with us tonight. And I just want to open it up. We do have a few minutes available for questions. Um, we do have. A question that's well it's not really a question it's more of a comment we have Jim Perlman commenting that no one has ever called him elderly at least not yet um, so I guess there's there's still time Jim still still years to come um, can you tell us more about where was Chadwick's Folly well Chadwick's Folly was out on at Squam and that was a bluff out I think it's on the um, east end of the island and there was a hundred and that was part of a hundred and thirty five acre uh, parcel. It was really quite, quite a place. But if I didn't say it was at Squam, I apologize. Um, and do you have any knowledge of, oh, this is an interesting question. So this person wants to know if there was any knowledge of a Wampanoag being hung in the Old North Vestry, where they, perhaps some trials were held there. Do you know anything about that? That's not the information I have. I, I'm, I, the information I have is from Fran Cartoonin's book called mm -hmm. Law and Order in Old Nantucket. And the, um, the, the hangings took place by the, uh, I don't know that, that anything occurred in, the, in, that anybody was hung in the, in, the new, in the vestry of a church. How horrible would that be? They were hung near the new town gate. And uh, there apparently was a gallows hill out there too, right past the gate where, where after you were hung, you were buried there. But I don't have any information about being hung in the church. Oh. That's not something that I've heard of either. Um, so thanks. What is the condition of the jail today? So it is open for visitors uh, outside of COVID, but can you just talk a little more about um, what, what it's like today? Well, it's kind of creepy, really. I, I, I remember the first day I worked there was kind of a, it was, it was a May, I think May of 2014 it was kind of damp and rainy. And, uh, but honestly, of all of our sites, it, it seems the most original to me, like, it, like the, the planks, the boards, the oak boards on the floor, the iron bars, they're all original. Um, there was some work done. I think there are new boards, new floorboards in the foyer and uh, a few more things, but really it, it's quite original. Um, yeah, and I think what, there's also, um, when the work was done to improve, improve the floorboards, there was an addition to the front, there's a, a small shed that's been added as well. It's not right. part of the building. No, um, there is a shed and it was, it's where we uh, kind of wait for people and there are some, there are a few things you can see in there. Uh, but the shed is, the shed is not part of the original oh, no. jail. Sure. And um, are there records of prisoners in the 20th century beyond what you shared in your presentation? So the, tw well, there, there were a lot of the 20th century, the 1900s, uh, there, there, there were some, I mean, honestly, the jail was frequently used for just like kind of lockups for people who had, you know, uh, waiting, they were picked up for being, uh, having too much to drink held in the jail, brought over to the, to the court the next day. So there was a lot of that. And I'm sure there were some other people I haven't mentioned, but for, for years and months, there was nobody in there. Um, which is encouraging in a way, right? The oh, real yeah. crime. Um, <laughs> and can you speak to, I, I think this is a really interesting question that this like idea of the jail is still being used and, and yet it's also a tourist destination. Um, I feel like that, I, not knowing more about it, I guess that feels kind of unique to me. And can you just like talk they a little really, bit? Yeah, it was pretty, it, it was kind of uh, very loose back in the day. There was another story that I didn't, 
uh, repeat where people where prisoners were allowed to go home for lunch or and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, the and there was another story <laughs> that. Uh, <laughs> oh, here's Norman, just plumbing it all. <laughs> I didn't describe the. Uh, excuse me, I'm I'm jumping ahead. No, go ahead. Please. Well. Uh, the plumbing, I, I wasn't, I didn't give great detail on that, but, but each cell had a little privy, which was basically a box that looks like a toilet, but it didn't, certainly didn't flush or anything. There was a, um, uh, what do you call that? A, a pot. That's the word for that. Anyway, there was a, you, it, there was a little pot there and uh, every so often that would be, that would be emptied. And that was, that was all there was to it. And it was emptied, by the way, there was a hole cut into the hallway so that the jail keeper could grab the pot from the toilet for the privy and take it out of the jail cell through the hole in the wall by standing in the hall and take it, taking it out <laughs> through the hallway. I feel like it should have paid better. <laughs> um, so that was, that was it for plumbing. Yeah. In your presentation, you talked about, um, you know, the Wampanoag who were hung at the town gate, but were there ever any white uh, European Nantucketers that were sentenced to be hung at the town gate? Um, were there any stories I, you know of? I have no information on that. I, I, it was, um, they were all, they were all, according to uh, Fran Cartoonin's book, they were all Wampanoags and they were all uh, crimes they were murders of other Wampanoags and the hangman was a Wampanoag and it was all very early. It was the last one, as I said, it was uh, 1769, but it started off in the 1600s. Um, so when you talk about the jails, not our jail today, but the one that's on the corner of Pleasant and High Street, is that building still there or um, has it as a house today or has it been no, torn down? I think it, I don't think the building is still there. I, I think it was sold at a certain point, but if, but I, but it was described, it was, a, I don't know what's there now, but it wasn't, it, that map that I showed you earlier from 1834 showing the downtown, that was, um, there was nothing in that spot by 1834. So I think between the time the jail was built in, what was it, 1761, and the time that 1834 map was made, the jail had gone away. Um, thank you. So we have just a few more minutes for, for questions. Um, and I, so I heard there was a liquor store. I did not hear this. I guess the, the questioner has heard there was a liquor store there during prohibition. Do you know anything about that? Is that true? Oh, I think you're referring to, I didn't mention this story, but, uh, during prohibition, when the sheriff confiscated liquor, uh, the sheriff stored it in the, uh, downstairs East cell. And so if you go in the jail today, you're actually going to see some of these early bottles and moonshine equipment in this cell. It's kind of fun. And I hear there's even more in our storage facility. So, uh, so that if that's the liquor store, that that's, that's all that's all I know about any liquor store. But it was during prohibition where they stored the confiscated liquor right in the jail. Okay, yeah, well, fair, fairly secure. <laughs> yeah, I would say. Um, so, okay, well, those are all the questions that we've had come in. So I just want to thank you so much, Anne, for sharing your knowledge. Um, this has been really fun. <laughs> I've, I've got a new appreciation, I feel like, for the old jail. Well, it's a fun right. place. So I hope, we're, I hope we're open soon, and I hope everyone can come through. Yeah, fingers crossed for sure. And I just want to thank everyone for spending a part of their evening with us tonight. We appreciate that. Media sponsorship for this evening's event is generously provided by Novation Media. Um, please join us on March 16th, so that's next Tuesday, for our next NHA University, which is going to be with Michael Harrison. He's going to talk to us about the story of Captain Joseph W. Plaskett and the links between Nantucket and the country Chile. So programs such as this one are made possible thanks to the support of our members. So if you are not a member, please do consider joining by heading to nha.org slash membership. Thank you so much and have a great night.